Welcome to the Purposeful Fitness with Coach Ola, where I dive in deeper into holistic health and fitness topics that will help you stay inspired, motivated, and dedicated to living a purposeful fit life while pursuing for the Akhirah. Hey everyone, assalamu alaikum and welcome to 23rd episode with Coach Ola. Before we start the episode for today, I w- would like to wish everyone who celebrates Eid, all of Muslims around the world, Eid Mubarak, as today is the second day of Shawwal and a second day of Eid al-Futr that is celebrated after Ramadan. I also want to mention this because I'm super passionate about it, that please, for every holiday that we celebrate in Islam, Eid al-Futr and Eid al-Adha, to remember our convert, revert, and single Muslims and Obviously, of course, everyone around the community as this time of the year can be very lonely and it can be very hard. So please, please, please make sure to remember them. And of course, a lot of the Muslims who might be struggling around the world and might not be able to celebrate today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our special guest for today, Pete Holman, who I met in person this year at the IDEA conference. Such a blessing and I'm super grateful. IDEA conference is a conference for personal trainers and there are East, West and the IDEA world. And it's conferences that trainers go, group instructors go to continue education as well as personal development and business development to become better personal trainers to help our clients. So Pete Holman is a super passionate person about the fitness industry. I learned a lot from Pete Holman who I attended his session this year as well as watched his recorded session through idea fit tv and of course through his social media i highly recommend that you check his work he's a certified strength and conditioning specialist and physical therapist specializing in biomechanics sports performance and outpatient orthopedic physical therapy he has worked with the nfl champion pittsburgh Steelers running back jerome betis and Hall of Fame blindside tackle from the New Orleans Saints Willie Rofe, world champion ski racer Chris Davenport, X Games gold medalist Mike Scholes, and MMA fighters Brandon Scope, Shane Carwin, and Elliot Marshall. His company, Aspen Core Fitness and product Ripcore FX, was acquired by the industry leading functional fitness training company TRX. He has developed and launched Rip Training Education and Programming worldwide with the help of some brilliant minds at TRX. Although he is no longer at TRX, he continues to travel the world presenting on core performance, foundational movement training, and sports medicine. He also consults on startup products beginning their launch into the fitness industry. Competitively, he was a U.S. National Taekwondo champion and team captain for the U.S. National Taekwondo team. He held an ISK Super Cruiserweight Freestyle Kickboxing title from Colorado and was a two-time Bass Rotten Tough Man champion. He grew up in Colorado skiing, snowboarding, biking, and trail running, but owe most of his athleticism to his first love, soccer. His focus as a professional educator, is on improving human movements and motivating others to bring out the best in themselves. Today's episode, we talked about the importance and the differences of different martial arts, self-defense, how to incorporate it into our lifestyle, and why it is important. We also talked about functional training, corrective exercises, how they are different and how they are the same, and why they're both important because they both overlap and we also talked about the importance of organizing our spine through our workouts so if you're someone who loves to work out this is super important to make sure to keep your back organized and we will explain it in this episode and of course we discuss much more so without further ado let's welcome pete hey pete how are you today fantastic thanks for having me you're welcome. So happy to have you too. So please tell us about yourself and what you currently do. Well, my name is Pete Holman. I'm a physical therapist and certified strength and conditioning specialist and former U.S. National Taekwondo champion. And more recently, in the last 10 years, I've been, become a fitness entrepreneur. I've been developing products in the fitness space. And we can talk about that if you're interested. But so, you know, kind of a jack of all trades, but really health and fitness has been my life. Uh, ever since I was a kid and, you know, and I'll, it'll continue to be my life until the day I die. Awesome. And no, that was a good question. Cause my next question is how did you get into Taekwondo? 
a taekwondo I, you know i always was fascinated with bruce lee <laughs> and so as a kid i you know i wanted to be an athlete i wanted to be a professional athlete and i tried a bunch of different sports i played football and basketball and baseball and lacrosse uh, and soccer i was really good at soccer and but i was very late to develop in high school i i graduated when i was 17 years old so i was pretty young and i was kind of slow to develop you know into a man i didn't have muscles i was kind of this tall you know gangly kid and then about at 19 or 20 years old, all of a sudden I kind of filled out and, you know, my had hair on my chest and that sort of thing. And that's when I discovered I was working at a health club and there was a Taekwondo class there and I would watch them and I would actually mop the courts. I was a maintenance guy at this health club and I'd mop the court across from the martial arts practice like every night for, for you know, half an hour, just mopping, mopping, mopping. And the instructor finally came out and said, why don't you put the mop down and come join our class? Because I was watching them so, so closely. And I did that. And it started a really fun journey. Two and a half years later, I tested for my black belt. Three months later, my, my coach said, hey, I think you've got a shot at making the national team. I said, I just tested for my black belt. I have no clue what I'm doing. And he said, I'm telling you, you're very athletic and you're, you know, got good balance and agility and explosive power and all that. I said, you've got a chance of making the national team. And so I kind of threw caution to the wind and went for it. And I made my first national team and went to Kuala Triangle, Malaysia and competed. And then my second national team was a couple years later, I went to the world championships in St. Petersburg, Russia. And I was actually nominated as team captain for that one. So, you know, that, and, and then, you know, I got into kickboxing and boxing and, and I've even done masters boxing, but I think I'm hanging the gloves up now <laughs> because I'm getting old and, you know, this is not for the, it's not easy on the joints, all this competitive martial arts. Yeah, because I actually want to ask you, what's the major difference between Taekwondo and the other form of self-defense classes that are out there? Because even I get confused between, I know how to do this, the kickboxing <laughs> form, but, and I know it's not the same. <laughs> well, there's, yeah, th that's a loaded question. There's so many different types of martial arts and, and self-defense. Taekwondo is kind of an orthodox, traditional martial art. Karate is similar. And there's different factions between karate and, and taekwondo. There's different styles even between those uh, two disciplines. And then there's something called mixed martial arts, which is more kind of inclusive. And it uses all different, you know, wrestling and jujitsu and karate and taekwondo. And th that's a little bit less orthodox. Usually you don't necessarily have, you know, like a, a dobok or a gi. And there's no necessarily pecking order. It's just more for training, health and fitness and more defense. Yeah, so that and of course there's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, that's more orthodox and that that's a real tractor system. But you know, if you want like street defense, if you're just you know, a lot of people aren't, you know, it's it's a important skill to have just to even know what to do if ever some situation occurs. There's a one called Krav Maga, and that's an Israeli self-defense. And you know, they've kind of become popularized because they do a lot of like street defense, real life situations if somebody you know, God forbid were to attack you in the street, know what to do and how to get out of there. So it's a pretty intense, hardcore training methodology. But it's so people that are really concerned or maybe, you you know, I've got a daughter who at one point will go off to college, you know, and maybe I'll put her in the Krav Maga class because it just gives you real life scenarios that on how to avoid conflict. And then if God forbid you are in a situation where you have to bend yourself, you, you'll be able to kind of get out of there with some defense techniques so then i asked that question it's because i can't pronounce it right just to see the japanese one how do you uh, say kar it karate no 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 no. it has a j in it i just cannot pronounce it just to oh, see. Ju oh brazilian jiu-jitsu i can't pronounce it yes that one <laughs> that's okay it's like the tongue um what <laughs> Yeah, when I was growing up and I was really young in school, I couldn't pronounce like S and T's. And I actually went to a speech therapist that helped me articulate those. But it's yeah, it's just language, language differences. But what's but, your question about? So a lot of people call it BJJ. It stands for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I'll go with that. B yeah. what? B what BJJ. Is but you can't do J's, can you? <laughs> you don't like this. What's your B question? Let's start with BJ, that. then a BJ. So, anyways, yeah. I had a friend who asked me about it, like, what's the best way to train? And she really wanted to go to black belt. But then I, I know it's 
a different sport from like taekwondo and it's not the exact same and it was yeah. so confusing at first <laughs> it's there 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 really are it's almost like languages there's so many different styles and dialects brazilian jiu-jitsu is is all about kind of grappling and it's very in close fighting it's taekwondo we like to use our legs and, and our distance and our range and keep away from people brazilian jiu-jitsu they like to be in close and they kind of get really good at joint locks and submission moves where you would you know put your opponent in a position of sub that would they have to submit whether it's a chokehold or an arm bar or a leg lock it's not necessarily the best street defense because in the street, you don't necessarily want to be, you know, locked up with somebody. You kind of want to create distance and separation and get the heck out of there. You know, that's, to be honest, the best defense is avoidance of situations that put you in harm's way. You know, you're a young gal. You don't want to be out late at night fumbling around for your keys in the parking lot or whatever in a dark parking lot. That's just, you got to just be more intelligent than that. But if you, if you want to get into more street defense... Again, this one, Krav Maga, I think is the best one that I'm familiar with when it comes to street defense. That's true, because they even teach it at George Mason University, and the guy who's teaching it said the same thing. And self-defense, there's might have this question here. It's because it has become so much needed, popular, and requested, especially among the Muslim communities, especially after what's been happening recently in the past few years and stuff like that. More women across different Ethnicities, backgrounds, cultures, what have you, are getting into it. But I've noticed, especially within the Muslim communities, they're getting more into it. And that's why I want to distinguish the difference and see which one is the best for self-defense. And there's and there might even be some local, you know, some of these just strictly self-defense courses really teach you a lot about avoidance and about how to hold yourself, even your posture, how you walk. You know, if, if you're timid and, and slow and again, fumbling around in your purse for your keys and you can't, you're on your cell phone and you're distracted or you have headphones on, you know, this drives me nuts where, you know, I see you, you know, like my daughter's 12, but she just walks around with headphones on kind of oblivious to the outside world. That's not a position of being aware of your environment and your surroundings. In the, in the Navy, they call it situational awareness in the U.S. military, and it just means you're aware of your situation. So, you know, if you go into in areas that might be, there might be some risk, inherent risk, uh, there's, you know, low light, it's dark, it, there's maybe a lower socioeconomic status folks that are hanging around. These are areas that you've got to be on high alert, and, and that's the best thing. And then if you have to, call a friend, have them walk you out to the car, or get, you know, a big guy to, you know, assist you and make sure you get in your car and get out of there. It's, it's really important stuff because, you know, one bad experience can really affect people. That's true. I think you already answered it, but I'm not sure if you fully did. If someone wants to learn how to self-defense, what is the one best tip that you can share with them? Well, yeah. So I would, I guess it would be situational awareness, just really being tuned into your environment. And that means, you know, know where you're going, get there in a, in a, a fast, you know, manner, and do it with confidence and, you know, have your keys prepared. And, you know, if you're, I, I keep talking about this because it's usually, you know, if, if obviously if somebody breaks into your house, that's a different scenario. And that's when you, you really maybe need to have some kind of martial arts defense skills because you're going to be in a compromised situation. But as far as going outside, just being aware of your environment, having your keys ready, looking around, making sure if you see something that looks a little shady, go back in your car and call a friend or call your, your manager, your apartment complex and have somebody help assist you get in into your place or into your car or out of your car. But be aware of your environment. Don't walk around with headphones on and your head down on the sidewalk. I'm guilty of this. So well, I'll, all right. I'll gonna, work on it. Work on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you, if you don't mind telling us because it's becoming more of a buzzword i've noticed our listeners what is exactly functional training well functional training has to do with a carryover from the gym to your everyday life or sports it's as simple as that so basically you're preparing yourself in the gym how you're going to move in life and daily sports or excuse me in daily life and sports so for instance when you are out maybe gardening or you're taking groceries in and out of the truck or you're hauling a suitcase, these are different movements than bicep curls in the gym. 
There's nothing wrong with bicep curls. That helps put mass and strength and, and density in your muscles and it builds strength and that's important. But at some point you need to integrate movement patterns so that you can move more fluidly with, with grace and with power out in the real world. And so functional training just has to do with getting your body moving. And, and a, a, a simple example would be our bodies move in three planes of motion. They kind of move front to back, that's called the sagittal plane. They move side to side, that's called the frontal plane or the coronal plane. And they move uh, in this transverse plane, which is a rotational uh, plane of motion. And typically in the gym, you see people doing exercises in the frontal plane, or excuse me, the sagittal plane, the frontal plane, or, you know, rotating. And those are great exercises. But what about combining all three planes of motion? For instance, a high to low chopping pattern or a low to high lifting pattern with a cable or an elastic bungee, uh, a squat overhead press that's linear, but it's again, it's involving more, uh, more muscle groups, more joints involved, and that's going to transfer over to daily life and sports better. So you wanted to be doing some form of functional training at some point to really prepare yourself to move and stay injury free and perform at your best. I'll let you know why I'm asking this question, but first, what is then corrective exercise? Well, corrective exercise has to do with you're correcting a dysfunction. So for instance, let's say you go to, to pick up a box, all right, or a suitcase, right? And you go to, you bend down and you bend from your back and your back kind of goes into this turtle position. That's going to put a lot of stress and load in your back. So there's a, there's a dysfunction there. We want to kind of hinge from the hips and use the powerful muscles in the backside of our body, the glutes and the low back and the hamstrings to kind of create that bending pattern. And so a corrective exercise might be a, some kind of a hinging exercise with a dowel on your back, if you've ever seen that, or maybe a, um, a glute bridge, you know, where you're on your back and you're just thrusting your, your hips up towards the ceiling engaging the glutes and the low back and the hamstrings. These exercises help correct the dysfunction, but you also have to have somebody that's smart that can identify the dysfunction. And that's why I think personal trainers or physical therapists or chiropractors, you, you want to get align yourself with somebody that can assess your movement patterns and see if there's a dis dysfunction. One thing about dif dysfunction is it's pretty tricky. When you're young, like you, it's not the end of the world because your bodies are pliable and, and fresh and mobile and, and, you know, things are functioning at a high level. But over time and over repetitive cycle after cycle after cycle, it's a mechanical model. It's like an engine. You know, if, if there's something wrong with your engine cylinder that goes up and down in, in the cylinder wall and it starts to vibrate, for instance, it might not be the end of the world the first few thousand cycles, but after you know, 20, 30, 40,000 cycles of vibration, it's going to wear out the cylinder wall. Your back, your knees, your shoulders are all the same way. It's not the end of the world when you're in your 20s, but trust me, when you get to my age, you want to be moving in a smooth, fluid, you know, pattern so that you avoid these dis dysfunction and you can, you know, continue to perform and, and have durability for the rest of your life. So then how are they both different from each other yet interconnected? What's that? You mean corrective exercise and functional, functional training? They're similar, but corrective exercise is a little bit more focused. So typically what you'd want to do is you'd want to start with movement, you know, basic movements. Let's say again, a squat. Okay. Let's just take a squat and you're looking at somebody, Hey, do their knees cave in? Do they, do they have a nice tall spine? Do they lean back with their hips and have a nice hip hinge pattern? Are they able to get kind of a vertical uh, excuse me, a parallel shin and spine angle. And if you identify dysfunction there, you want to add some corrective exercise. Let's say the knees cave in, you want to strengthen up the glutes, the lateral hip uh, abductors and external rotators. Once you have your kind of alignment and you're doing a basic squat pattern with proficiency, then you can add more intricate functional movement patterns. So they, they, are, they are essential to one another. You have to have good movement, clean movement, in the basic patterns before you can get fancy with these three-dimensional integrated movement patterns that are more functionally based. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And then as I asked that question, I saw just, I think yesterday on Instagram, someone, uh, also a fitness professional, the caption had the function, like you shouldn't be doing functional, you should do a corrective, but sh the function was in quote unquote, as like, it wasn't taken seriously. And I am a functional fitness specialist, 
And my next professional goal is to become a corrective exercise specialist. But I thought, you know, it's not true. It's important to also work on functional exercises and at the same time, corrective exercises. They're both needed. So I, I thought I should ask you. Yeah, that, that, that's accurate. And, you know, so functional exercise, when I really got into this industry, I graduated from physical therapy school in 1997. And, and so I was kind of focused a little bit more on therapy, but then I started doing more strength and conditioning. And about two or three years later, I was introduced to this guy, Juan Carlos Santana. Now, for you youngins out there, you probably have never heard of him or you might not remember him, but he was, he really was inspirational to me when it came to functional movement patterns. And he, so he would do all these like really amazing spiral energy, you know, spiral lines, uh, high to low chops and low to high lift patterns and horizontal chops and split stances and staggered stances and really a lot of, you know, quote unquote functional movement. And he also would, he, there, at the same time, there was also people that kind of took this and ran with it. And that's an expression meaning that they, they went overboard. So all of a sudden they're standing on stability balls, you know, like Bosu or, you know, Swiss balls, excuse me. They're standing on a Swiss ball with weight on their back and doing a squat pattern. And that's pretty high risk to reward exercise. And he was the first one to tell you he did that exercise. And guess what happened? He fell off and tore his ACL. So he was trying to do functional exercise that would carry over to sports and daily life. And in so doing, he actually tore his ACL. And he's the first one to tell you that I made a mistake. I got a little bit too carried away with functional exercise. So it, it, it begs the question is, and it's dosing. How do you dose exercise? And that's what, you know, as you go on your path towards functional exercise and corrective exercise, you're going to start getting better and better and having more and more experience with how to properly dose. Not everybody needs to be able to stand on one leg and do a low to high chop, nor should they do that from the first you know, month of training with you. However, over time, there are people that are, let's say, manual laborers, they're construction workers, and they're balancing on beams and they're moving drywall in and out of a truck. Well, they're going to need some rotational strength. They're going to need some stability on one leg. They're going to need the ability to, you know, kind of dynamically stabilize their core in three-dimensional space during complex and heavy moving tasks. Well, at some point, yeah, you're going to want to introduce them to some functional movement patterns that help map to how they move in their daily work. So you people can get carried away with it, but functional exercise is still prevalent and prominent. And in fact, in a physical therapy world, the first thing we do as a patient comes in, we say, hey, what are your goals? And we find out, are they an athlete? Or do they play tennis on the weekends? Do they golf? Maybe they sit at home, but then on the weekends they garden. Or maybe they're, they have a, a newborn baby and they're always carrying their baby in their arm and lift, transferring the baby in and out of the car. This is all valuable information, whether you're a therapist or a trainer, because you're going to have to figure out a program that maps to your client's needs to get them the best you know, goals. Now, granted, a lot of people come in and say, I just want to look better on the beach or, you know, in my wedding dress or whatever, and that's fine. But also you need to find out how they move in daily life and in sports. And the program's going to really closely resemble and map to their functional goals and functional outcomes. If you're not looking at functional outcomes as a trainer, you're really not doing your your client's uh, service. Thank you, because the functional word has become a little bit of a buzzword, unfortunately, in our social media world. Have you noticed that yourself? How like everyone is like, oh, functional, 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 but... Yeah, and some people don't really even understand what that means. So, yeah. you know, but you, you got to understand what it means. And then the hardest thing is how to apply it. And that's what takes years. You know, I'm. Uh, it's funny, I'm going to be 50 years old this, this fall, and I feel... You know, I've, I think I've been a good therapist and a good trainer for a number of years, but I feel honestly like I'm just kind of getting in my sweet spot. And today I had a client that came in and she had multiple things going on. She had knee pain. She had an ankle fracture from a year ago. She, she was having some back pain. And at the start, you're kind of like, oh my gosh, this is like too much is going on. But over time, I've, I've recognized what to look for. And I look at mobility patterns. I look at strength you know, in the hips and the low back. And I look at how they move in space. Can they hinge? 
And all of a sudden, it becomes pretty clear, all right, we got to work on some hip strength. we got to work on some ankle mobility. we got to work on some core strength. Then we got to work on a hip hinge. And right, that in itself is a lot of stuff to do. But it's there's a reason for that. Once we get all that stuff corrected, then we can start to add weight and load and speed and change the environment and start to have more functional movement patterns integrated into that programming. But it takes time to learn this stuff. It does. And great segue for the next question, because what inspired you to create a TRX RIP trainer? (laughs) Well, so I was training an X Games athlete. And and if you haven't seen the X Games, these guys and gals are nuts. I mean, they that this guy was a snow cross athlete. So he takes jumps on a snowmobile, which are like 500 pounds and travels 70, 80 feet in the air and lands and then has to do a bank turn. And he came to me, he was getting ready for the X games. And he said he was having some low back pain and he felt like his core wasn't strong enough. And so I tested his core. It was pretty good in, in what's called the sagittal plane of motion. So front to back, like a plank. But as soon as we started to rotate, he, he was, he couldn't align his spine. He couldn't generate power from his hips. And I said, boy, I wish I had something that I could use to mimic a snowmobile handle. And I was literally lying in bed one day. I looked up at my closet rod and I said, that would make a pretty good snowmobile handle. And I just pulled all my clothes off, put an elastic cord on one end and started to go uh, in my garage and play around with it. And I was pushing and pulling and, and, and rotating and kind of jousting with it. And I instantly felt my core kind of light up and i said this is this is something good i played with it with this athlete mike schultz and he didn't go on to win that year but he since then is like a seven or eight time gold medalist at the x games he's he's been in the olympics and i'm pretty sure it was all the rip trainer uh his his reason for success no he was an amazing (laughs) athlete he's an amazing guy but that was the start of it and then i i made some for my clients just kind of prototyped a bunch and then one of my physical therapist friends used it. And he said, this is the best thing. He says, you've got to bring this to market. This is the best thing I've ever used. And, and eventually I met TRX. And it was before then, it was called the Ripcore FX. And then I met TRX and Randy Hetrick, who's the founder and owner of TRX. It really fit in his product suite because they have, they're all about fitness anytime, anywhere. And it's, it's a product that you can use anytime, anywhere. It's fairly low cost and There's low barriers to entry. So we created a partnership and, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. I'm on, I think, four to five different continents all over the world. And we've sold close to $20 million worth of product. And I'm really pleased with uh, how it came out. I have an interesting story for you. So I last year at the IDEA conference, 2018, I attended one of the sessions for TRX. And obviously we had the TRX Strip Fact Trainer, right? But I did not know it was you that created it. So when I found out, like, this is so interesting, like, small world. But I did not know it was it was you behind it. <laughs> so it so was cool. me. I, I um, you know, I was telling you at the, at the start of this interview that I've gotten into a little bit of fitness entrepreneurship. And my first product was a functional training rack that held stability balls and medicine balls and elastic resistance and, and foam rollers and stuff like that. And I, I just got this bug where I thought if I can help solve a problem that's in the fitness industry, because that's the industry I know, and I can, you know, have fun doing it and maybe even make a little bit of income to help supplement what uh, the other stuff I'm doing. It's, it's a, it's a win-win for me. And so I've just created my, my third product is called the Nautilus glute drive. It's a plate loaded hip thrust machine for your glutes and it helps groove the hip hinge pattern. We've been talking about that. So it's actually a good, It's actually could be considered a functional training exercise because of how it transfers into your hip hinge pattern. And um, and I'm working on my next product right now. It's it's under wraps, but I'm very excited about that. That's going to be great for posture and core strength and grip strength. So yeah, getting into fitness entrepreneurship. That's awesome. It's actually my next question. How did the glute activate come together and what inspired you to put it together? But I feel like you do and dive in it a little bit more. Yeah. So, so you're talking about the Nautilus glute drive? Yeah. 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 So that was a product. And again, a lot of these, I'm literally working with clients daily and I see things in it as I'm working with them that bother me, they're problems. So I was doing a hip thrust. So for your viewers that out there that don't know what a hip thrust is, if you just lie on your back, bend your knees 
and lift your pelvis off the ground. That's actually called a glute bridge. But if you elevate your shoulders onto like a horizontal bench to get more range of motion, that's called a hip thrust. And so that's become very popular. Brett Contreras is, is a PhD researcher out of, he was out of Arizona. Now he lives in San Diego, but he was doing a lot of hip thrusts and he would actually put a barbell across or, or a dumbbell on somebody's lap to make it, to increase the load and progressively overload the body so you could get stronger. So I was doing these hip thrusts in the gym and I noticed my client was struggling with their back position and they actually complained that their back hurt as they had their shoulders elevated. And so I put, do you know what an Airx foam pad is? It's like a, it's like a pad you can balance on them. You can use them to kneel on. It's just like a big squishy pad. So anyhow, I put this pad behind his shoulders as he did the hip thrusting motion. And I noticed how the pad articulated with his back. And I thought, why isn't there a bench that helps you kind of, you know, it's comfortable and articulates and helps you with the hip hinge motion. So I went out and went to a fabricator down, you know, where, where I live and started to create this machine that had an articulating back pad that you could load weights onto your body and do a hip thrust without all this elaborate setup and without the pain and discomfort. And so that was, that was the inspiration. And then I was just fortunate enough to have a friend that was knew a guy that bought a lot of equipment from Nautilus and he, they put us together in contact and I kind of showed them my patent and what I was working on and they got really excited and said, hey, we'll give it a shot. They still didn't know how successful it was going to be. I knew how successful it was going to be because it's a really needed invention, but the guy, uh, the head of product engineering and development and, and innovation thought we'd sell a couple hundred the first year. We've already sold almost 2,000 and it hasn't even been a year yet. So it's, it's wow. really exciting and it's helping people learn how to engage their glutes without hurting their back. That actually made me want to ask, what are your thoughts about the glute bridge exercise? Because I know there's so many opinions out there about it. So it's, I want to see your opinion. Well, the only opinion that matters is mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, it's, it's, a, it's a gold standard exercise for physical therapists. So there's a common problem and it's called gluteal amnesia. And it sounds kind of funny, but it's literally like your glutes have fallen asleep. They're not, they're unactivated. One of the things that we do commonly as a race now is we sit. We sit in the car on our way to work and then we get to work and we often sit in a cubicle and then we sit back in the car and then we get home for dinner and we sit. And then what do we do? We watch TV on the couch. And what happens is when you sit, your hip flexors get very tight from that position. The hip flexors, when they're very tight, it, they, this gets a little complicated, but they inhibit the glutes from firing because they're so tight. It's called reciprocal inhibition. So if you have very tight hip flexors, the glutes are, have a hard time turning on. So we have to start doing exercises that are specifically geared towards stretching the hip flexors and firing the glutes. So instead of this position, we start to get in this position. And that's, that's what the glute bridge does is it just, you're on your back, your knees are bent and you just lift your hips up off the ground and you'll feel it right away in your backside, your low back and your, and your buttocks and your hamstrings. And if you, if it's too easy, you go to one leg and you just do a single leg glute bridge. And those, that's a great way to strengthen the glutes and to help give you strength and power and the, and one of the most important core muscles in your whole body. And that's the glutes. I was going to ask you this question because, again, from there's so many like you know opinions, research, and that, and it can become overwhelming on all of us. And so I thought it was not a good to do. Then I heard one of your sessions from the Idea TV, and you talked about it. But you also activated the core, uh, the glutes first before you dived into it. So you don't just dive into it before activating the glutes. Yeah. So there's a it's there's, a there's a, there's a progression, you know, to do that. Now, one thing you have to make sure is. This is a common mistake. People, as they go to, to lift their hips up, they arch their back, you know, the opposite way so that you're, you know, we talked earlier when you pick up a, a box that the spine can turtle. Well, that's called a flexion. This is extension or hyperextension. So it's where your spine kind of goes the other way. And sometimes people, as they lift their hips up off the ground to do a glute bridge or a hip thrust, they will overarch the back. And that can that can kind of jam the, what's called the spinous processes and the facet joints and put a little pressure on the discs in the back. So what you want to do is you want to have a light abdominal contraction, kind of lock your spine in neutral. And then as you 
hip thrust or glute bridge up, it's all coming from the hips. So you're right. It is important. You got to do it right. But listen, any exercise, whether it's a squat, a deadlift, or a push-up, if you do it wrong, it can be damaging for it to you. And that's where, where that's why you need a personal trainer or physical therapist to help coach you along and create a little program, almost like a recipe. Imagine a chef creates a recipe, you know, for you to follow. You're create as a personal trainer, you're creating a recipe for your clients to follow. And if you do step one, two, three, if you look at the whole recipe, it's a little overwhelming, right? Like a Wolfgang Puck recipe. <laughs> it's like, I can't do this. But if you just simply follow the instructions one by one, believe it or not, you get to the end. You're like, you know what? I, I'm Wolfgang Puck. I got this. And, you know, this morning, just, just this morning, as I was teaching boot camp, one of the ladies had a really bad deadlift form. And I had to see her like right after the class. Like, and I use all the knowledge from the conference, thank God. But <laughs> it's it gets harder when it comes to teaching and a group fitness because that's yeah. a, side, a side topic that <laughs> another episode. And that, my friend, is why I don't teach group fitness. No, gr group fitness is amazing because you get this camaraderie of the group and you get this energy and you've got music on and it's amazing. But you have to do a pretty good job of demonstrating the exercise. Remember in our course, I talked about the different types of cueing. You've got visual cueing, verbal cueing, of course, and then tactile cueing. But you visually, you got to give them a model in their mind's eye of exactly what the right deadlift form looks like. Then you talk them through it. And then you have to be really good as you're going through coaching the, the group up. You got to give them real quick cues on how to align themselves. And then you did the right thing. You pull them aside after class and maybe spend another two to three minutes saying, hey, this is something I want you to work on. Thank you. Or you sell them some personal training and say, hey, I can help you with this, but I think it would be better one-on-one. -on -one. And you're not, that's not a sales pitch. It's literally the truth. It's like, hey, you've got some areas of dysfunction that I think we can help you with, but we're going to need to spend at least one session to kind of get through that. And then we'll get you right back in the group setting. I was told the same thing, but I'm one of those trainers that still struggle with selling myself. <laughs> well, so, sorry. Uh, so then it's a good way to talk about the spine being organized and why is it, why keeping our spine organized and our core engaged is really important and how can we work on it? Okay, good. But I do want to address, quickly address this. It's very common for people, especially new to the industry, to kind of have some doubts and some fears and some difficulty kind of selling yourself because we're not in an industry that, you know, we don't, we're not used to selling, you know, dishwashers or cars or something. We don't have those sales pitches down like a, a seasoned salesperson would have. But at the same time, what I do know that each and, every, each and every one of us have inside is the ability to connect with a client and build rapport and give them your heart. You might not be the most experienced trainer, but I, I've met you before and you you genuinely care about your clients. And that's why you come to continuing education courses. Don't forget that. And so you do have knowledge and skills and you've got the, the, the heart and the soul to connect with your client and to have lasting impact on them. And nobody can take that away from you. Even a trainer as experienced as I am, I might not be able to connect with them like you can. So don't sell yourself short. Regarding the spine and organizing the spine. So Ola came to one of my sessions and I had a spine model. Actually, hold on. It's right. <laughs> I don't I don't travel without my trusty spine. This is Fred. And so every every once in a while during the session I would say organize your and then I'd hold up the sp spine and everybody would iterate spine. And so organizing the spine just means you've got curves in the spine. So there's supposed to be a lumbar curve which is in your low back. And then you get up to the mid back and there's a little bit of a thoracic curve. And then there's a, a cervical curve. And when you look at the spine as one unit, imagine somebody in the military, they're standing very tall and correct or in a Pilates instructor. Just imagine a perfect spine posture. That's what I call organization of the spine. As soon as we go to move, a lot of times what happens is the spine becomes disorganized, meaning it's chaotic, it's, it's bent and twisted doesn't mean the end of the world but if you go to lift something heavy and your side bent flexed and rotated that is the number one cause of posterior lateral disc herniations 
So you don't want to pick up a heavy box or your child or a suitcase and have a flexed, rotated, and side bent spine. You want to kind of bend from your hips, get in a deep squat or get on one knee and lift and have your spine in a nice organized fashion because over time, the spine degrades and there's little things in between the spine and you see these this is a disc and that disc has fluid in it and there's annular fibers that go around the outside of the disc and as you bend and twist and rotate that's normal motion but over time that stress and load especially if you're carrying heavy objects can start to degrade the discs and then if you have a if you're doing a deadlift and you're in improper form forget it you can actually herniate a disc and that's that's a real problem that might even involve a surgical intervention down the road so you got to be careful with your spine and organize the spine yes because i have been there many years ago deadlifts went wrong and had like high doses of the inflammation and couldn't work out oh, so it's yeah. very very important it's important and it's also a great lesson that people you know, we're very competitive as humans, which is a good thing for on the surface, but it also gets us into trouble, right? So if you're in a group fitness class and all your buddies or somebody else is doing these heavy, you know, amazing deadlifts and you want to compete with them or you want to be, you know, challenge yourself like they are, they might have been doing it for six years already. And you're it's your first year of doing deadlifts. Or maybe they've got stronger lumbar spine muscles and stronger glutes and they can handle more weight. You just got to work at your own pace. And again, that's what the trainer's so good at doing is kind of dosing the exercise as far as sets, reps, load, and you know overall volume and intensity. All these parameters need to be manipulated. You know, just like an orchestra conductor, you know, manipulates the orchestra and they tell the horns to come in and the percussion and the keyboards and the string instruments. But there's somebody coordinating the whole thing. If you just go haphazard, even a even professional orchestra doesn't sound good, right? So you gotta, you know, you gotta conduct your orchestra and make sure you're, you're dosing all the sets, reps, volume, and load properly. Yes, and that's why it's also important for the core to be engaged. When it says engaged, what does it mean for like the average person? Because I feel it's core hard. engagement. Yeah, it just so. People think to have a core activation, you have to walk around like a stiff robot. That's the furthest from the truth. You can't, in fact, it creates dysfunction if you walk around like that. Now, if you go to pick up a really heavy box at UPS or you've got a suitcase and you're going on vacation and it's really heavy, you know, heavily loaded, then you have to really have a strong bracing of the core. But for the most part, you just want what's called a minimal to moderate contraction during activities, just a light bracing of the core. It means that the muscles are kind of alive and awake, but they're not taut. Because remember, fluidity and grace and speed come from actual you know, timing and rhythm and coordinative function of the muscles, which means some muscles turn on at just the right time and others turn off. And, and you get, like if you watch a ballerina, you know, a ballet dancer dance, it's unbelievable because one second they're stretching in this beautiful swan position where one leg's up and they're balancing and they have tremendous mobility. The next second they're jumping up and exploding up into the air like a basketball player. And that's explosive power. And, and when they do that, they have to have a little bit more core activation. When they're stretching and doing their graceful moves, they don't have as much core activation. So, you know, the, the, the core is a really important component in exercise and in daily life and in injury prevention. But it's, uh, again, it's kind of a dosing issue. You, you don't want to walk around with a stiff, tight core. Otherwise, you're going to be very inefficient. You're going to not be able to breathe through your diaphragm and you're going to have a hard time. You know, here's, the, here's a simple thing. Let me see if I can. So if you take your hands and put them around your waist, not your ribs, just below your ribs, around your waist like this, and you just push out on your hands just subtly, okay? So if you're watching this, just push out on your hands subtly. That's as simple as it gets as far as bracing your core. All you're doing is getting that those abdominal hoop muscles kind of engaged. And also it's going to give you more room for your diaphragm to descend down and breathe into those into the lower lungs. But you've got to get that core engaged by just pressing out gently. And that gives you a little bit of stiffness and kind of elastic energy. You know, the muscles are, are kind of like elastic. So if you take an elastic band and it's just droopy, it's on slack, there's no energy in it. If you stretch it just slightly, you've got what's called stored 
potential kinetic energy. And then if you let go of it, it springs. So you want your core muscles to be just slightly contracted so there's some elasticity there. And then every time you move, you're going to have a protected spine position, but you're also going to have all this stored energy. So if you want to serve a tennis ball overhead, you've kind of got that coiled energy through through your core. Thank you so much. This was so helpful. And I can probably ask you like on and on and on questions. <laughs> But where can kind of when someone stay in contact with you? Well, the best, so I do a lot of um, what's called quick fit tips and for not just for trainers, but for fitness enthusiasts, I'm on Instagram at Pete Holman one. So it's H-O-L-M-A-N and then the number one, Pete Holman one. And then I'm at Pete Holman on Facebook. So please connect with me if you have questions, comments, concerns, I can, I feel those. And I also like to put out a lot of content. It's all free and it's just quick little tidbits on how to, organize your spine, how to engage the core, how to focus on balance and posture and alignment, and some things that I think really help out not just trainers and coaches, but general fitness enthusiasts. So come find me at Pete Holman One. So everything will be in the show notes, including TRX Strip Trainer, uh, his, his Instagram, and he is very indeed approachable. So thank you so much, Pete, for your time and all your help. You're, you're welcome. And thank you for what you do for the industry. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe today and leave a five-star review. You can also screenshot and share this episode with a family or a friend. Be strong, be fit, be fit for Akhira. La, 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 la.